Talking very specifically about black spaces allows us to get a better understanding of the historical narrative and why gentrification has been problematic for black and brown communities. The historic site is a site of memory. Mm -hmm. Then memory helps build identity, identity builds community. Community and institution building is really a form of resistance. Revolution is not necessarily a, a white male American concept. My name is Stephanie Johnson Cunningham, and we are discussing black spaces today on display. Even though we don't define spaces as white, black, or brown, the spaces that we live in America, unfortunately, are not race neutral. Weeksville Heritage Center is a historic site here in Brooklyn, New York. It used to be a bustling neighborhood created by and for black people who needed a space of their own. It's one of the first known free black communities here in Brooklyn, here in New York City, and also throughout the country. Weeksville is, is important because it was a site of black self-determination and a place of refuge for black people. And when it was formed in 1838, James Weeks and a group of other black investors purchased land from the Lefferts family. The idea was to have a, a, a space where black people could just live their lives to the fullest and, and in search of the American dream, just like other Americans. Right. They were creating a community, a place where they could live, grow, and achieve. Black people weren't invited to own homes everywhere. That still happens today. So Weeksville provided a space for black people to own homes and to own businesses. And during that time, it was especially important because land ownership for men meant that you could also vote. The historic site is a site of memory. Mm -hmm then memory helps build identity, identity builds community. Community and institution building is really a form of resistance. So much of what we tend to learn about black history is sort of a catalog of overcoming wrongs that have been done to black people in this country. And that's all valid history and it should be known. Weeksville is the flip side of that. It is a story of self-sufficiency and self-determination and entrepreneurship. Um, the fact that we have these houses and we're sitting in one of the houses right now um, just shows you that, in fact, black people were here. They had an idea and a vision of the future, you know, that, that these institutions and this community would carry forward their memories. And all the while they're here, you have some great firsts. You have the first black woman to be principal in a New York City public school, Sarah Garnett. You have the first black female doctor in New York State, Susan Smith. McKinney Stewart and Weeksville's not unique in that regard. You know, over these black towns all over the country, you know, again, where black people are trying to live and prosper and just thrive. Black spaces provide people not an opportunity for isolation, but again, insulation, where they're able to grow and develop and to be confident and to have spaces that they feel welcome, that they feel um, is their own, that they feel safe, and that they feel is a reflection of who they are as well. And we know that every group wants that, every group craves that, and so we see there are needs for spaces for LGBTQ communities. Absolutely, there needs to be spaces for women, black people, we need spaces for brown people because we are not a part of the white cis gender men um, narrative and culture. 
By 1930, Weeksville ceases to exist, and it wasn't until this 1968 where these houses were rediscovered, and that started this community-wide archaeological dig and effort to save these houses and prove that they had historic value. So now there's an, another side of Weeksville, and so how does the visitor center and the, the new educational building kind of speak to the vision and history of Weeksville? What the visitor and education center does is it gives us space to convene, where you not only get to learn the history and convene to discuss issues, you know, everything from how to deal with your student debt to black maternal, you know, mortality rates and what can be done about that to food justice, to reparations, but you can also just come and celebrate and just be black. In an evolving Brooklyn, things can get lost. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we have this site that is, a, again, a site of memory here that people can come to and know that there's real black history here. Weeksville was actually one of the first places that I interned. And that space is really important to me. And this summer that just passed, 2019, they almost closed their doors for good. I remember how that almost crushed me to see this institution that meant so much to me and had so much of my history there that was going to be closed. These are challenges that are not, you know, unique to Weeksville. You know, there's been many reports about sort of the disparities in investment by the philanthropic community uh, to institutions of color. What we see now, the shrinking of black spaces throughout right. the country um, speaks to that issue. Right. And I think so important for us to, you know, send the call out to everyone that we know so that people can contribute in a real way so that we're not waiting for some sort of savior, but right. we can save ourselves. Right, and I think that the important, you know, sort of message for people is there are many incredible black and brown institutions out there. Yes. Find a, the institution you care about and give them money because they need it. Growing up, honestly, seeing the neighborhood change right in front of my eyes has been traumatizing. And having no control um, is really troubling. We know that our communities have been targeted, have been impoverished, have been left behind and ignored for many, many years. Are black people owe reparations? Absolutely, 100%. The history is here to show you that America became a super power because it had free labor. So the justice claim that black people have is with the United States government. That's fair. And when we see that there is money that can be appropriated for all kinds of things, and it could be done if there were the will, and, and I believe there is a growing sort of sense of, like, how do we make right what is you know, in a lot of ways been baked into this country, you know, sort of like when you think about the inequities, the school to prison pipeline, you know, the incarceration rates, you know, you think about housing. housing. The conversations are moving in the right direction. Major presidential candidates are yeah. talking about the how need for reparations and how do we address mm -hmm. centuries long inequities, you know, in what is supposed to be the greatest country in the world. Talking very specifically about black spaces allows us to get a better understanding of the historical narrative and why gentrification has been problematic for black and brown communities. The Black Gotham Experience reimagines the spaces directly impacted by the African diaspora as human stories explored through interactive walks, talks, events, and art. The Black Gotham Experience is situated now as a media company. Mm -hmm. We started by doing walking tours and highlighting the Black diaspora in New York City mm -hmm. that you can't tell its streets, street names or monuments or memorials. New York City has a lot of deep history embedded in the transatlantic slave trade that has been redacted for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so to have a psychic sense of where you are mm -hmm. and how those patterns set in the past mm -hmm. affect you now. Mm -hmm. Like before we discuss gentrification and, and the 99% versus 1%, those systems come from an operating system that go back mm -hmm. to the 1600s. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why New York City has one of the most segregated school systems in the country mm -hmm. and has some of the That's biggest right. wealth gaps. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's important to know where you are mm -hmm. because it affects real people. You can walk around New York now and find statues and street names after people who are either founding fathers or fought in the American Re Re Revolution. But there's people of African descent that were early uprisers to the British, but they weren't all white men fighting over money. They're often a pregnant black woman fighting over her child, fighting over her soul. But that person is unknown to most New Yorkers and the built environment doesn't show that story. So part of what we do by coming to Maiden Lane and discussing that rebellion and celebrate the fact that the first people to grab a rifle and fight the unwinnable war was not white men that owned enslaved people who were mad about their taxes. It was Africans upset about being enslaved. Some people just kind of think that the Harlem Renaissance is ground zero for black culture and black cultural investment into the city. And part of what I'm looking at teasing out is that's just not supported by the facts. Yeah. If you look at the creation of New York in 1664, before there was a New York, there already was an African neighborhood. So land ownership is a bedrock of power, which is why black people have continually had efforts to take away the ground on which we stand, right. even right now. Right. Even if we think about Central Park right now, before Central Park, it was Seneca Village, where it was a thriving black community. And so that community was removed because they wanted to create Central Park. Even in the Bronx, large highways are built through those communities, through eminent domain. You can't take black people out of the American story and have anything left. There are certain stories that need to be highlighted more than others. Now is a moment to just be in tune with celebrating those redacted narratives. And so I think that the work that we're doing, we have found ways to make sure we're investing into the culture and into the community. Everybody's welcome, but the content are topics that black folks should be talking about, like discussion about black masculinity, about entrepreneurship, about travel. These are conversations that give people opportunity to be amongst a room that might not be all black, but you're talking about these topics in the panel are often people of African descent. Ta-Nehisi Coates um, said it recently. He said that we aren't gonna see full equality until people start seeing us as full human. And so it's really important that we have the opportunity to create our own narratives and to create our own industries, to create our own um, growth in business and economics so that we are seen as just as powerful as any other group as well. Because you need the inspiration of the past if you're going to build a bright future. Take, let's take that inspiration and go out and do some good in the world. Mm -hmm.